Hi there, this is Just Nigeria. Coming up on the program. Eight years in darkness, residents of Ikba Ibekwe in Akwaibon State seek lasting solutions to blackout. I don't have light. That is why I broke my leg. I cannot see my house again because of darkness. People and movement. Commuters lament restrictions on commercial tricycles and motorcycles in Lagos State. Everywhere that motor went and everywhere that uh, this thing, uh, bus went, uh, you have to enter bike and go. So the thing is affecting me upside down. It's affecting me everywhere. And the technology giving Kenyan pupils a healthy school lunch. Plus. Hey guys, my name is Prince Namdi AK. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm the co CEO of Conga. Come check me out. The entrepreneur giving a platform to small and medium businesses to grow. Welcome to Just Nigeria from the BBC and Channels TV, where we bring you the stories being liked, shared, and tweeted about by the social media generation. I'm Ajoke Hulootse for our top story this week. Can you imagine living with little or no access to electricity for not one or two, but over eight years? Now, that has been the plight of residents in Ikba Ibekwe, despite being the host community to the Ibom power plant. Just Nigeria's Wale Fakile has been to the community to find out how those residents are faring. Ikba Ibekwe, a community in Ikota Abasi, local government area in Akwa Ibom State, is home to the Ibom Power Production Company. Residents of this community have locked down the gates of this power production company with traditional restrictions. The absence of regular electricity supply has left these people frustrated. The service so essential remains equally elusive. It looks and sounds like a festival here, but it's not. Residents have been protesting here at the plant, bringing all activities to a standstill. For them, it's electricity or nothing else. Benjamin Friday is one of the organizers of the protest. He tells me this is not the first demonstration. We're protesting for light because this plant, they built this plant for about 15 years now. And ever since they built this thing, there is no light. They don't give us light and we have remained in total blackout. And uh, if we want to go into it, the health implication of this plant being here is on us. And a lot of us have been dying in silence. So that's why we want to come, we come at this time to say that we need light, that this plant should give us light. The Ibom power plant began operating here in 2009. State-owned, it contributes about 115 megawatts to the national grid powering city centers. Residents here say the government ought to treat them fairly since they have hosted this facility for over 10 years. They had depended on the Aluminum Smelting Company of Nigeria for electricity until it shut its doors in 2012. Since then, residents claim they have experienced partial blackouts for about eight years. Its nightfall and eight-year-old Wisdom Efros Lobe is wrapped in darkness. Left with no option, he relies on this kerosene lamp for light. Wisdom and his family are some of many who feel hard done by this situation. By using lantern to do work. But it hurts for me. So if you see light now, what will be the first thing that you do? I want to watch Tom and Jerry when there is light. Seventy-five-year-old Justina Henry feels helpless and wonders if this community is still part of the state. Like wisdom, she depends on unconventional sources for light. On one occasion, this alternative fell so short, she says she nearly lost her life. I don't have light. That is why I broke my leg. I cannot see my house again because of darkness. It was our scum that used to give us light that we use in the whole community. Since Auscon left, everywhere is dark. We cannot see again. 
I was going to take my bath in my backyard, then I fell and broke my knees when this handheld lantern went off on my way, and then I fell down. Hit this my knee. Since 2015, I am not able to go to places. I am not active as I used to be. It's the same tale of gloom for small business owners like Ima. Her hairdressing salon is constantly powered by generating sets. She tells me this has affected her bottom line and left her wondering if it's profitable to continue. This my shop used to be well stocked up. Nowadays, if you stock the shop, there is no customer. Because the customers are not willing to pay for using generator, there is no light. Customers prefer to pay what I charge them when there's public power supply, unlike when I use the generator. It is getting difficult for business. I was even thinking of closing business if there's no light and do something else. With all I've gathered from the community, I've returned to the capital, Iyo, to meet this top official of the plant. He also doubles as the senior special assistant to the governor on power. Governor had already approved a substation behind Ibom Power. That is a separate substation. That when completed, will be used to serve the Kwai Bekwe and Nkwarabasi only. But Ibom Power has no license to distribute electricity. They have license for 685 megawatt of generation for electricity, not to transmit, distribute, and sell electricity. He adds that the community was cut off from the grid due to outstanding bills. During this riot, governor instructed somebody to go and pay five million naira so that they can be reconnected, even though PSGTC is saying it's owing 55 million. The people went and they were not allowed to reconnect. They said that is not the power they want. They want power from even power. And the input in it is that it is going to be free power not power they pay for. Our quest for more answers led us to the Port Harcourt Electricity Distribution Company, the disco serving Ikwaibikwe and Ikotabasi. The company's spokesperson in a phone conversation says Ikwaibikwe was taken off the national grid in 2019 due to a debt profile more than 16 million naira. Okay, uh, well, sometime in November 2019, Okay. Uh, the community was uh, disconnected, arising from uh, non-payment of electricity over a period of time. Okay. And of course, you know that uh, PHEB will only survive, and of course, indeed, the power sector, uh, uh, through payment of electricity by customers. Mm. So uh, when, uh, for a period of time, they were not uh, forthcoming in terms of payment, then we have no other option than to severe the, uh, the power supply in the community. And that's exactly what happened. And okay. like I said, over 60 million uh, is about 63 million. But residents maintain there's been no power supply and the debt profile is a result of estimated charges for electricity that was not consumed. After our first visit to the community, an agreement was signed between representatives of the IPC and a youth association. PHEDC is to reconnect electricity supply to the community. In the interim, without charge while the Bomb state government is to construct a power substation. A review of the situation is expected to hold soon. This is not the first time an agreement has been reached, but residents of Ikwaibikwe seem more determined to hold authorities to account. Wale Fakile, Just Nigeria. Well, I can't even imagine living without power supply for one month. Must be an intense struggle. Now, moving from one struggle to another, it's been three weeks since the restriction on commercial motorcycles and tricycles was implemented in parts of Lagos State. 
while some commuters have complained of insufficient alternatives. Affected motorcycle and tricycle riders are counting the cost. Just now, Nigeria's Damilola Odolo tells us more. Lagos is Africa's largest mega city, with a population estimated to be over 17 million. It is Nigeria's most economically vibrant state and is home to global investments worth billions of dollars. Getting around Lagos is quite difficult due to regular traffic and in some cases poorly managed road networks. Rail and water transportation are not popular amongst commuters who often feel safer on the roads. In a move that affected thousands of commuters, state authorities announced restrictions on motorcycles and tricycles within six local government areas, nine local council development areas and along ten major highways. It hasn't been an easy life for commuters since the Lagos State government implemented the ban on commercial motorcycles and tricycles in the metropolis. This has also left thousands of commercial riders jobless without hope for employment. Even in the streets where I'm staying, there are some places where I want, I can go. Do you understand? That I want to go. But I can't go there because there is no bike. Not everywhere that motor will enter, not everywhere that uh, this thing, uh, bus will enter. You have to enter bike and go. So the thing is affecting me upside down. It's affecting me everywhere. Samuel is a tricycle business owner who started what he calls corporate keke with one tricycle. His business grew and he employed 12 other tricycle drivers. Now, he and his men are out of job. Right now, I don't have anything I'm doing again. And this is the business that I've invested my time, my money, worth like 10 million in it. I've not even seen capital surplus of profit. We are pleading for governor that he will have mercy and he will reverse the ban. Gift started riding commercial motorcycles to earn a living and cater for a family. Like Samuel, she's uncertain of what the future holds. It, it has been so, so difficult for me since the ban occurred in Lagos State because I had no other means of earning a living. That is just the only way for now that I'm, 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 I'm putting food on my table. And I, I had so, so many responsibilities. I have my younger ones looking up to me. With the restrictions being enforced, it would have been expected that the gridlocks would ease off. But it seems the situation has only worsened. I had a program at National Theatre. I had to trek from the theatre down to Shita. Like there was no means of getting down here. I trekked home and I was very sick. In a recent interview, the Lagos Deputy Governor says the administration only implemented an already existing law. It has been in existence since 2012. It was revised by the uh, past administration in 2018. So it's a law that has been there for like nine, ten years. Hamzat adds that the decision was implemented to reduce cases of crime and accidents in the state. So we now found out that the, the tricycle and the the the, 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 the the, the Okada now is now the vehicle for transporting drugs even to our schools. So the, the, the security of our of lives, the prosperity of our children cannot just, we cannot just ignore it. The governor of Lagos State, Babajide Sonwolu, says he will roll out alternatives. He has launched eight locally manufactured speedboats which will operate on the waterways. He has also declared that the ban on the motorcycle and tricycle in the state popularly called Okada and Kekena Pep would not be reversed. But how long more will it take to make the lives of commuters easier? Damlola Udwulu, Just Nigeria. Indeed, a challenge that government must rise up to tackle. So how are other African mega cities regulating the activities of commercial motorcycle and tricycle operators? Let's find out in this week's 360. Last year, Addis Ababa banned the movement of all individually owned motorcycles within the city following the increase of street crime and accidents. However, the city has drafted a regulation requiring motorbike operators to form an association, get licenses, and have a GPS to operate in Ethiopia's capital city. The use of both motorcycles and tricycles is permitted in Kenya. On the condition that the vehicle is licensed, riders must be registered with an association of not less than 100 members. 
commercial motorcycles must wear yellow helmets, and all members, as well as the driver of a tricycle, must use seat belts. This week's 360 roundup, certainly one or two things to learn. So, have these restrictions affected you in any way at all? Share your experiences with us on Twitter at Just Nigeria TV. We love to hear from you. Still ahead on Just Nigeria. The wristband making feeding affordable for school children in Kenya. Stay with us. Welcome back to Just Nigeria, the show for today's social media generation. I'm Ajake Hulotse. Thanks for staying with us. Coming up, we meet the music producer turned e-commerce entrepreneur. Now, thousands of school children in Kenya can now get a healthy lunch using a prepaid smart wristband. Food for Education, which runs a lunch program for students, introduced the Tap to Eat system, subsidizing the meals and helping parents bear the costs. The BBC's Njoroge Mogai reports for Just Nigeria. Food for Education and the work we do makes me feel very good and makes me feel that we are contributing to help solve something that's been persistent for many years. My name is Aurora and I'm the founder of Food for Education. We provide affordable, high quality meals to students in public primary schools. Tap to Eat is an innovation by Food for Education that allows parents to prepay for meals. We came up with it when we saw that a lot of kids, the 15 shillings that they pay, though small, a lot of them couldn't be able to, for example, pay for a week or pay for a month. It was very varied and it was very difficult for us to keep track, for example, who has paid, who hasn't paid and things like that. We needed something that was inefficient and could also account really fast. And so we came up with Tap to Eat, which we were linking mobile money and PESA to NFC wristbands, which look like watches. And once it's been topped up, they just tap and get their lunch. The total cost of the meal is 25 shillings, and that's for everything that goes into the meal. Many parents can't afford 25 shillings, so right now we lower that cost for parents to 15 shillings. We provide the 10 shillings extra for each meal that we distribute through donors and corporate partners that we have here in Kenya. The challenges I used to face include my child losing their lunch money. Sometimes they haven't eaten any food because they've bought sweets. When you pay for the tap to eat, you're assured your child will eat lunch daily. Tap to Eat has enabled us to scale faster. It's very quick. It takes a very short time to be able to validate those payments. It's enabled us to have more consistency in terms of parents being able to contribute for meals and also have a quick uh, serving of lunch. Well, technology to the rescue. And to other stories, seafood industries throw out tons of fish waste every year, mostly in the form of fish skins damaging the environment in the process. But where most people see fish waste, Newton Owino spotted an opportunity through a process called fish tanning. It salvages these discarded skins, turning them into leather products. The BBC's Anthony Irogo reports for Just Nigeria. Yeah, these are fish skin that comes from uh, the industries here. These are filleting industries. Every year they produce close to 150,000 metric tons of this fish waste. So almost 80% of that consists of uh, the fish skin. Initially this used to go into the environment and cause a very heavy destruction. What we thought of doing is actually to convert this into a sellable products through a process we call tanning. That's when we now thought of actually bringing uh, the women uh, from uh, nearby Islam together so that they could form groups. And after that, we gave them uh, what we call the pre-tanning operations training. Now that they know how to do the fleshing, they know how to do the scaling. After here, we buy whatever they, sh they have already processed. We take it to our tannery, where we are now going to process it again, now into finished leather. In most cases, when the skin arrives here, this is how it looks like. You can see it has uh, scales, it is still raw. And then we hang them from the turning drum, process that we call aging, so that you know the excess water can drip. 
then we pile them here then after drying we use them for making different uh, finished uh, fish leather articles like jackets and other and from there we move to check me out our weekly showcase of Nigerians doing amazing things around the world. This week, we check out Prince Namdi, AK, the e-commerce entrepreneur who is back home to bridge the gap between e-buyers and sellers in Nigeria. Business is war. You don't need people who will die for you. You need people who would fight for you. Because a dead soldier does not add value to the war. Hey guys, my name is Prince Namdi, AK. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm the co-CEO of Conga. Come check me out. I went to a lot of schools. I was an above average student always in school. I was like a math geek. I used to go for a cowbell math competition. I used to do very well. Yeah, so I think that was my strong suit in, uh, in primary school. So I traveled outside the country for my education. First, I went to Switzerland for two years before I went to the UK to do my university. So I studied economics and politics at the University of Lancaster for about three years um, before I left, I left the UK. And, but during my time in the UK, I also did a lot of odd jobs. So first, I, I was into music production at that point in time. So I, I used to make beats and sell them to, to my colleagues. I used to, I used to buy and sell products. So I had some sources from China that I used to buy headphones and different products and sell it in school. I also used to sell music production, production um, software in school just to, just to help me with my funding. My favorite music artist is David Doe. And not just because we went to the same secondary school, but I mean, he's a great artist. I mean, if you look at the guys in the industry today, they're really pushing the boundaries in what we call, um, in what we call Afro beats or, or African music. And I mean, what they're doing is really incredible. So when I moved back, um, I founded Udala after just a few months. And Udala was an omni-channel retail platform. So we had an e-commerce site, but we also had physical stores. Eventually, there was a merger between Yudala and Conga to what we have today, the new Conga. She always gives a story about one of our merchants who is in Balogu Market. Um, she, when she started off on her platform, she was struggling. Um, she had one small shop. She had about three children. She was struggling to take her children through to school. But we were excited. I, I was very excited to hear a few months ago that this, this woman had three children now school outside the country and she's expanded her operations to about four stores across the country. So I mean, such simple stories, they excite us because at the end of the day, what, what we're doing is we're connecting buyers and sellers and bringing them together. So whereas you just had a few customers in your store in Balogun, we're giving the access to the whole of Nigeria to sell your products. So I mean, the impact is, is quite huge. I'm definitely privileged. I mean, I mean, I grew up from a good home. I, I studied outside the country, but um, I, I won't say that is enough to be successful in anything you do in life. I mean, one thing is to be privileged. Another thing is to have the work ethic and uh, have the mindset to succeed. I always tell people that success is where hard work meets, meets opportunity. So yeah, you can have the opportunity, but if you don't have the zeal and the mindset to fight through things you need to fight through, you'll never be successful. So guys, I'm Prince Namdi AK, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm the co-CEO of Conga, and you just check me out. Great advice there. Be ready when that opportunity comes knocking. Admirable Prince AK. Now, let's take a quick reminder of our top story. Despite hosting the Ibom Power production plant, residents of Ipa Ibekwe community in Akwaibom State are seeking lasting solutions to blackouts. I don't have light. That is why I broke my leg. I cannot see my house again because of darkness. That's where we're wrapping up today's show. Don't forget, we want to hear your views. So join the conversation right now on Twitter at Just Nigeria TV. And for more on any of our stories, visit bbc.com forward slash Africa and channelstv.com. Thank you for staying with us. Until next time, I'm Ajake Olootse. Goodbye.